Hello and welcome to How to Practice Lake Care from Home. This is a partnership between City of Gem Lake and the Badness Lake Area Water Management Organization, known as VLAMO for short. I'm Nick Voss, Education and Outreach Coordinator with VLAMO. This will be an intro to how our neighborhoods connect to lakes and wetlands with some tips on how to make that a supportive relationship. First, I'll start with the big picture of our watershed and then we'll work our way into the Gem Lake area. So the Vlamo watershed is about 24 square miles. It's outlined here in this map in that red border. It has 15 lakes, over 500 wetlands, Lambert Creek, and of course, lots of shallow groundwater. These are all things that shape and influence our work as a water management organization and efforts on both private and public properties can help us accomplish our goals of protecting and enhancing our shared water resources. The city of Gem Lake actually overlaps with two different watershed organizations. Glamo, of course, is the main one with most of the city area. And the other one is the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District. This is the two areas outlined in red, just off of County Road E. If you live in one of those spots or if you're a business in one of those spots, this talk will still be applicable, but the Ramsey Washington organization has programs and resources that are probably more relevant to you. So I encourage you to check them out, but this will still cover the basics for any watershed. And obviously we just love the word watershed, so that's thrown around everywhere. But uh, yet another example is a sub-watershed. Uh, every lake has a sub-watershed, and that means the area immediately around it that drains into that basin. Uh, the basin could be a river or a lake or a wetland. In this case, we have Gem Lake, and the sub-watershed boundary is outlined there in blue. Everything that happens on the landscape, for better or for worse, will impact that basin over time. This sub-watershed is 363 acres, and it is the only sub-watershed in the Vlamo watershed that is a dead end. That means it doesn't outlet to another lake or creek or a ditch. It's kind of a closed circuit. This could be a really good thing for keeping a lake healthy because there isn't the same amount of influence as something like East Badness Lake where water is draining in from miles away. But we got to pause here and ask, like, what's the point? Why take care of a lake from home? Why bother paying attention and trying to adjust our habits? There's no wrong answer here, totally open-ended. Take a moment to think about it or think about why you would take care of a lake from home. Here's one reason I'll offer from the big picture of Minnesota's water resources. Over half of Minnesota's lakes and rivers and wetlands are listed as impaired. Just taking a look at the impaired waters list is a pretty sobering experience. So Gem Lake has something in common with all these other water bodies, and that is that it's a lot more expensive to clean up a lake on the tail end after it's been impaired than it is to protect it and preserve that water quality on the front end. Here's a quick look on how Gem Lake compares to the lakes around it. Lamo keeps track of a whole array of data, and this graph provides a quick and easy look on the average total phosphorus for Lamo shallow lakes. And I'm focusing on phosphorus for this graph because phosphorus is a key nutrient in lake health. It's a main driver for algae growth once a lake is dominated by algae, it leads to a whole domino effect on other things that hinder the lake and keep it stuck in that turbid, murky water state. And that also increases the risk for toxic algae blooms, which is obviously something we want to avoid. And then we get into the real nitty gritty. How do we take care of a lake from home? And at this point, if you're kind of skeptical on whether or not you can make a difference, that's okay. We'll just go with it and you can make your own call at the end. But I do bet there'll be at least one thing that you could start trying as soon as this week. 
So let's start by imagining Jem Lake was a dishwasher. Again, just go with me here. What do you do to take care of a dishwasher in your own kitchen? Well, pre-rinsing helps the dishwasher last longer and work better, takes out those crumbs or some of that gunk that you really don't want to deal with. So the same concept applies with a lake or wetland. The pre-rinse happens in the upstream headwaters areas, whether you have small streams and wetlands before they lead into the larger water bodies. Of course, it's not fun, it's just like any other chore, but we do our chores because we believe in the payout and we are interested in that final result. If we don't keep up on it, there's consequences. And that's a lot like that container in the back of the refrigerator that only gets worse if you avoid it. You'll see my diagram changed from that natural stream connection to a system of ditches. That's mostly what's happened in our watershed as we've converted streams and wetlands into ditches going back to the 20s and the 50s. And this actually took away some of that pre-rinse function that the watershed naturally did. And that's the same concept as human health. If you have a problem and you avoid it, it's just gonna get worse over time. So the rest of this talk is going to be along these lines. Thinking about the watershed as a health plan, a routine of checks and active care. So think about when you have a mole that's looking a little goofy and you're kind of watching it over time and you're just trying to gauge, is this a problem? And uh, you know, uh, it, uh, you gotta pay attention. Same thing happens on our streets, from storm drains to ditches. There's a lot of things that can slip by under the radar. The picture on the left is in White Bear Township. That is a stormwater outfall leading into Lambert Creek. Everything you see at the bottom of that tunnel is from the street level. That includes sediment, salt, anything that's on the street from automotive fluids or trash. But it also carries nutrients, and that goes back to that phosphorus graph that I mentioned earlier. The picture on the right is something that might happen during a construction project. It might look like just a bunch of dirt and well, okay, well, if it rains, it'll just wash away and it'll be gone, right? Well, not if you're thinking about the connection from the street to the lake. You might have seen something similar in a popular movie like Christmas Vacation, where poor, where poor old Eddie is unaware of the connection between storm drain and the nearest water body. But there's more than just sediment and nutrients that... Here's a little detective challenge. The two photos on the left are the same substance. I actually took both these photos here in the watershed. If you said water softener salt, you're correct. These were obviously dumped for some sense of convenience, but it's really an irresponsible move, both for the watershed and for the city time and cost to clean it up. We can't talk about chores without talking about the reality of pet waste. It's another thing that may seem natural or that it just breaks down, but pet waste is very nutrient dense. Unlike wildlife waste, we have a much higher density of pets in an urban area, and it's also laced with harmful bacteria that can wash off and run right into surface water. It's also better not to leave it sit because as it breaks down and sits for up to a year, the same doo-doo pile can continue to leach nutrients and bacteria even if it's on turf grass. Here's a couple other things to watch for. On the left, it looks like something was poured right over the storm drain and splattered all over. And on the right, it looks a little more innocent, like maybe it's just some soap but wash water is also something that should stay out of storm drains and ditches. That goes for mop buckets, carpet cleaning, and even car washing. This is why most of the storm drains in Gem Lake are printed with this stamp on the top of them. Dump no waste, drains to waterways. So back to the health plan idea, you start to get into active care and the doctor is going to recommend to keep these things out. Healthy diet means avoiding sugar, avoiding excess salt, and on and on. For the lake health plan, this is what should stay out of storm drains and ditches. Household chemicals, yard and pet waste. Yard waste is another big one. It seems natural, but extra debris loose on the surface like that encourages nutrients to travel from the landscape 
to fresh water. And that's something we want to slow down and avoid whenever possible. That debris also chokes out the vegetation, creates disturbance conditions that invasive species just love to take advantage of, and it clogs and chokes out our wetlands and ditches and even lakes. So that reduces the storage capacity that we actually really need for a balanced watershed. And like with dumping and storm drains, it creates a burden of maintenance when that happens in the human body. Of course, that leads to those bigger issues, like a diagnosis of something like diabetes and, and what have you. Like I mentioned, construction site sediment, laundry, car wash water. It's actually recommended to wash a car over the grass or partly over the grass so that that runoff doesn't make its way down the street. The best case scenario is to go to a commercial car wash and they'll capture that wash water and send it to the sanitary sewer, which is totally separate from the storm drain system. Septic tank discharge, sanitary wastewater, again, stays out of storm drains and ditches, chlorinated pool water. And there's a special procedure there that I'll touch on. And I admit it's not going to be convenient because if you've got a habit of dumping your leaves and grass clippings, it's going to be hard to change. Just like it's hard to get out and do a half hour of exercise, but you just got to do it. The fancy phrase for all of this is called illicit discharge. You don't really need to know the technical pieces, but it really comes down to responsible hazardous waste disposal, responsible yard waste disposal, either with a county compost site or a curbside hauler service, picking up pet waste ongoing, washing cars on the grass or commercial car wash. And the trick with pool water is to let it sit stagnant for a week before it's discharged. When it is discharged, that's a lot of water that can rip up an area with all that volume and velocity. It should drain over an area that's grassy or vegetated, and it should be low and slow to prevent erosion. So active care means that we're all on the same team effort. If you've got a friend that's got that funny looking mole and you're kind of concerned about it, you're gonna say, hey, you know, I think you should go get that checked out. For the watershed, there's really no monitor going around to find these things. That would be nice, but for now, this is what we've got. Reports can be anonymous, and reports from the city of Jim Lake actually go to Wiper Township because of the connection and partnership between the township and city of Jim Lake. When you make a report, it's helpful to have a photograph, document any location or cross streets that are relevant. If you see vehicle types or license plate, that's important too. It can be a scary or intimidating thing, but it's actually something to be proud of. This is our shared water resources, shared public space. And if you're able to make a difference for a friend to get that mole checked out, you're going to feel pretty good about it. And the same thing applies here. Gem Lake itself has a wonderful success story that we can all be proud of, so I had to mention it here. It was once on the state impaired list, but was delisted in 2018. So that was a big accomplishment. We're not able to say what exactly was the kicker for the improvement, but it's often a combination of several efforts adding together. One of the big ones that happened back in 2010 was a partnership with MnDOT, during the Highway 61 reconstruction. That picture on the bottom was transitioned into more of a bioswale or a water quality supporting swale on the east side of Highway 61. You can see from that map that this large industrial area with lots of pavement gathers all that runoff into the green dots that are storm drains and that goes under Highway 61 into Gem Lake. If there was no pre-rinse there, that's a lot of gunk, sediment, nutrients, salt that's washing right into the lake. So if that ditch is planted with vegetation that can stay standing higher and rooting deeper, it's an extra layer of protection. Vlamo kept track of the data for Gem Lake over time and eventually the MPCA, the MPCA agreed to delist it from the impaired waters in 2018. And these active care projects can take many shapes and sizes, whether they're large or small, they're all valuable and part of the larger picture. Rain gardens, bioswales, native plantings, and shoreline restorations. 
These are a couple examples of projects here in the watershed. Another big one is the Gem Lake Heritage Hall bioswale. This is one of the longest running and most successful practices, or what we call best management practices, in our watershed. Going way back to 2010, it's actually now reached a mature plant community, and it does look a little more scruffy and maybe even wild than a conventional mowed turf. But these actually are native grasses and forbs that are intended to be there. It's a bit of an adjustment in terms of aesthetics, but again, it's like a pre-rinse for the lake. And this site has been maintained over time to help keep it to the desired plants. And it actually adds a lot of character and texture to the neighborhood. These pictures show a variety of colors and flowers and pollinators that will appear on the site. And even in winter, that standing grass helps make it less of a frozen tundra, if you will. So with that, I hope you've taken at least one tip away from this. And Vlamo represents more than myself and more than the staff. There's an active community of folks learning and growing about all of these landscaping strategies and ways to be mindful of lakes and wetlands. I invite you to be in touch with us. We've got uh, email, newsletter, active social media. We also have a cost share program. Businesses and residents can apply for financial funding to help get these practices of rain gardens, native plantings on the ground. We've got a whole bunch of resources on our website to help plan and make decisions on that process. We've got news projects, a lot of the big stuff that we do in partnership with our partner cities. We've got interactive maps. And lastly, volunteer opportunities. If you are the sort to dig in and be involved on a community level, I'd love to connect and tell you about the things we're working on. You can also volunteer with adoptadrain.org. It's something to do on your own time individually, and you'll find all the steps for how to get started there on the website. Thank you so much for your time and for watching. Be well and take care.